now's a great opportunity for you to think about this, uh, this scenario and to make some guesses as to why this millipede glows in the dark. And that's when you'll transition from inductive reasoning to deductive reasoning. So let's say you think that this millipede glows in the dark because perhaps this is a way to warn organisms not to eat it. Let's say this is a warning color. You think that this is a warning color. In order to show that this is a warning color, you would have to, uh, to make an experiment. And so now is an example of a paper that is using deductive reasoning to try to explain why these millipedes glow in the dark. And this is a great example because it's a very simple experiment. And the hypothesis was that the, the luminance, the, the glowing, was to warn predators that this millipede is toxic. And this millipede is toxic. It produces cyanide. So it's not a good thing to eat. So what they did was, was they made clay models. These researchers made little clay models of the millipede. And some of them, they made them glow in the dark, and some of them they didn't. And they put these clay models out and they let, them, uh, they let them sit there overnight. And then in the morning, they went back and checked to see if there's any bite marks on the clay models. The bite marks would suggest that a rodent or some predator tried to, to bite it and tried to attack the clay model. And what they found was that the predators were biting on the non-glowing millipedes. Well, using deductive reasoning, they, they suggest that predators won't bite the glowing, uh, the glowing millipedes because they think that the glowing millipedes are toxic. This is an example of deductive reasoning stemming from inductive reasoning. And whenever I show you examples like this, I'll often include the paper on the bottom right or the top left or somewhere in the corner. And you'll, you can look up that paper and read it on your own time if you're interested in this stuff. And it's, this is a really cool experiment, super simple something that, you know, this is something you could conceivably be involved with, you know, as a graduate student in just a few years. So this whole process uh, makes up a framework that we call the scientific method. And the scientific method is something that we present as a, a kind of a, a flow, a flow chart, a very organized process, but it really is kind of messy. And when you start doing experiments yourself or looking into how these things really evolve a lot of times it's it's just a sloppy back and forth but generally speaking it goes like this you make an observation oh these millipedes they glow in the dark then you ask a question why do they glow in the dark then you form a hypothesis that answers that question i think they glow in the dark because it warns the predators that they have cyanide in their bodies then you make a prediction based on the hypothesis which is i predict that Predators will attack a non-glowing clay model more than a glowing clay model. Then you do an experiment to test the prediction. You make the clay models, you go out, you do different replicates, and you have all of your science friends help you out. Then you gather the data and you analyze the results. Those results either support your hypothesis or do not support your hypothesis. Then you report the results in a scientific paper. That paper goes to a journal, and we'll talk about that step next. But if the hypothesis is not supported, you can see that it still goes and you still report it, but then you try to find the reason why. What's important in this process is that you're letting nature tell you how it works. You're not telling nature how it works. So you don't make an experiment to prove your hypothesis. You make an experiment that would disprove your hypothesis or allow you to say that it's hard to disprove. It's kind of a, a weird way of thinking, but basically science is founded on the principle that we don't really have a way to say what's absolutely true but we can say what probably isn't the case. And so a lot of times when you hear scientists talking about science, they won't ever speak in the affirmative. They'll never say, oh, this is what's going on. They'll say things like, oh, this, w this suggests that this is happening 
or it's likely that this is happening. And that's just the way scientists talk because we can never really prove things 100%. We're always using deductive reasoning to show what isn't the case, but we're always open to the possibility that future experiments could actually disprove what we think is the best explanation. When you do have these results and you want to report them, you report them in a peer-reviewed journal. And there's a lot of different peer-reviewed journals, and these are different than what you typically find in the news. So a newspaper is not peer-reviewed. Uh, a lot of what you read, let's say you go to Google News and you read something on BuzzFeed, that is, that is not peer-reviewed primary literature. That sometimes is based off of peer-reviewed uh, primary literature, but it really isn't um, as thorough and rigorous and as reviewed as these uh, scientific papers that come from these journals. Let's look at what makes these peer-reviewed journals distinct from other kinds of media and other kinds of news. When you make an experiment, and this is something that we may do in, in labs, in future labs, you want to make a simple and direct experiment. You want to test just the hypothesis that you have, and you don't want to inadvertently test other hypotheses. So you want to make sure you're testing one thing at a time, and that can be a little more deceptive than I just said. You also want to have a control, and controls kind of remove variables, and we'll go into that more as we have better examples that illustrate what controls are. You also want to have a good sample size, because if you have a small sample size, your results could be just due to chance. So an example of that would be, let's say you want to show that a penny is 50-50 heads and tails, but you only flip the penny twice, and both times it's heads. Well, you can't say that this penny only is heads up because you only did it twice. You would have to flip that penny like 100 times before you started showing that it's really 50-50. If you did it twice, there's a good chance that you would have uh, you would have an error due to sample size and you would have heads twice or tails twice. And then you collect the data. So you have to decide what kind of data you'll collect. And finally, you have to analyze that data. When you're finished with your experiment, uh, you write a manuscript and you attempt to publish your experiment in one of these uh, peer-reviewed journals. So the structure is very very consistent with these peer-reviewed journals and this is a structure that's been used for a very long time and it's kind of helpful that the structure is so basic and predictable because I can read a paper from 50 years ago and I still kind of know how to navigate the paper. It keeps things consistent over time but it, it kind of makes things feel a little dry by today's standards but that will be a consistent way of communicating to scientists in the future. You also make a paper to fit your particular journal. You want to think about what journal you're going to write for. So let's say you're doing this experiment with millipedes. You're probably going to publish that in an insect or arthropod journal. Now, once you submit the paper, uh, other scientists get to read it. And they send that paper out before they publish it for other scientists to review it anonymously and to either OK it and say that it's good science and that it all checks out or they say that it's not good science and you did something wrong and then they'll either reject the paper or they will ask you to revise certain parts of it and this is a really important step and this is what makes peer-reviewed literature different from all the other literature that you find about science peer-reviewed papers have gone through this rigorous check and they're not necessarily checking to see if they agree with your science. They're checking to see if you're approaching science from a non-biased perspective and if your experiment really does show what you're saying it shows and if you're not saying that it shows too much. Uh, a lot of times we extrapolate or we make conjecture about our experiments and say that they're showing more than they really are showing. Essentially, after peer review, your paper is either rejected or accepted Oftentimes it's rejected, and if it is accepted, it gets published, and then it's presented in these peer-reviewed journals as information that other scientists can access and use, and they can then kind of piggyback off your research and advance what you did and gather more insight and knowledge into the way that nature works.
this is the process through which scientists have over time built uh, a grand idea of how we understand nature and this stems from astronomy our understanding of physics you know there's math journals there's journals on technology there's journals on biology and all of these journals are kind of the source material that's used by scientists to then generate new hypotheses and further our understanding. So where do you find primary literature and this peer-reviewed science? Oftentimes through your university or through your college library, you can find a lot of different peer-reviewed papers. Because peer-reviewed publishers are, are very, let's say, lock and key with access to their their journals it can be a little clunky using online libraries but indeed uh, on dvc's website or on a lot of different college websites if you're a student you'll have access to a lot of peer-reviewed literature you could also go to the library and pick up the actual physical hard copies of these journals and that's how uh, that's how we used to have to do it but a lot of this material is now published online and a really easy way to find peer-reviewed literature is using Google Scholar which is one of the lesser known Googles but it is a great resource and really can help you find almost all published research pretty quickly pretty easily and a lot of times you'll find a paywall but we'll talk about how to address that in, in later lectures in later assignments we'll look at this process and we'll we'll do some comparative homework here and we'll, we'll really get a better understanding of how to read this kind of literature but at this point i just want you to know that there is a, a distinct difference in the way that we publish these peer-reviewed scientific journals versus a lot of the material that we find uh, online or or in the media that gives us information so this is a different way of getting information and it's it's very rigorous and it's a very thorough process that is our best way of ensuring that we are building um, verifiable results upon verifiable results that's all I have for you for this lecture and I hope you enjoyed our discussion and our introduction to biology and science <music>